So great to be out here tonight. Um, my name is Jake Harris. I'm a member of uh, the Peace and Social Concerns Committee here at Friends Meeting of Washington, I'm joined here by Madison of the Union of Concerned Scientists and Helen of Veterans for Peace and the Golden Rule Project. Helen Jacquard is a, the project manager for the Golden Rule Project and a volunteer with Veterans for Peace. She is on the ground team for the Golden Rule Project. So the Golden Rule, of course, is the physical ship that is sailing around the country to do events like this and to educate everybody on nuclear abolition and larger advocacy. The ground team is supporting their efforts, and she is here to speak a little bit about their work. I'm also joined by, thank you, one sec. <laughs> I'm also joined here by Madison Rose of the Union of Concerned Scientists. She's an outreach specialist at the UCS. Her work involves a lot um, with Back from the Brink, which is a grassroots advocacy organization that is a very diverse coalition of organizations, faith-based groups, and secular that help work to build public consciousness around nuclear abolition. So I'm gonna turn it over to Helen first to speak a little bit about their work. It's really nice to be in a Quaker meeting house. I spend a lot of time with Quakers, partly because it was Quakers who first sailed the Golden Rule in 1958. But in order to just kind of set the stage, I'm gonna show the film first because I think that it really speaks well to why we're here and why the Golden Rule was sailed in 1958 and what we've been doing since then. And when the movie is finished, it's only 10 minutes, then I'm gonna talk about what we did after 2017 when this film was made and kind of a little bit about nuclear issues today. Well, here we are on the morning of February 3rd, 1946 on this far-off Pacific paradise, over 4,000 miles from San Francisco. There are only 167 human beings here, 60 of them children. From the coconut palms, the pandanus, and breadfruit trees, they get food, and the material for their dwellings, of which there are only 26. They depend on their own arts and crafts. They are proudly self-sufficient. They are astonishingly intelligent. They are a gentle and lovable people. Yes, life is simple and beautiful on Bikini Atoll until today, February 3rd, 1946, when there enters into Bikini Lagoon a fateful thing, a grim, huge symbol of civilization in its most terrifying form. Arriving as Commodore Ben H. Wyatt, United States Navy, with a startling request. Will the people of Bikini abandon their paradise so that the United States can use it for a certain experiment with the fantastic, the incredible thing called the atomic bomb. essential crew away from this. We also I'm grateful to be here. I've been the uh, skipper of this vessel uh, for a couple of months now. You know, this is a very small vessel with a big mission. Uh, the wind is calm now. What we generally get is we get that westerly flow. and it's, it's In San Diego, I'm retired, and uh, we've got a two-year-old grandson, and whenever I think of him, I think of the future that we're going to leave. And uh, I've got to be involved in this. We've got to leave a better legacy than what we've got going on right now. I got involved in peace work in 2006 at a time when I didn't even know there was such a thing as a peace movement. But I met my partner, and I asked him, what do you do? And he said, I'm a peace activist. So that same year, we both joined Veterans for Peace. He's a veteran. Uh, my partner, Helen, and I uh, have been involved with it for the last three years. We've been trying to bring this, the whole mission into fruition, and uh, quite successfully. We have a huge uh, family of people who've crewed the boat, and people who've organized the events, and people who are supporting us in various ways. One of the five principles, founding principles of Veterans for Peace is to end the arms race and ultimately seek the elimination of nuclear weapons. 
This boat is an icon for that because it represents a different way of thinking about how to do protests. You know, the original folks who uh, did the protests uh, were not making any traction. So well, they came up with the idea of how can we grab public attention, and that is, let's get a sailboat, sail it from Los Angeles to Hawaii and then to the Marshall Islands, and let's cause a disruption of the nuclear testing that's going on in the Marshall Islands. August 6th, 1945, the first atomic bomb ever to be used against people was dropped on Hiroshima. And August 9th, Again, on Nagasaki, a different kind of bomb was dropped. At the time, Albert Bigelow was in the Navy. He was a 30-year Navy captain. He was in Pearl Harbor at the time that these bombs were dropped. And it was so horrific to him that he quit his Navy commission a month before he could have retired with full pay out of protest of the dropping of the bombs. His family, a Quaker family, later hosted the Hiroshima Maidens who came over to New York for plastic surgery, reconstructive surgery, so that they would be in less pain and could lead a more normal life. The United States continued to develop newer, bigger, better bombs, and there were a whole series of atomic bomb tests in the Marshall Islands. They were producing elements that don't exist in nature. One of those elements is strontium-90, it acts very much like calcium, and it was blowing all over the planet. And because it acts like calcium, it was getting into our baby's teeth and bones as they were growing. They were getting into mother's milk and cow's milk, and women were testing their milk for radiation before they would feed it to their children. So because of all of this and the major concern about radiation poisoning in our atmosphere, a group of Quakers decided that they wanted to do something about it and they started the way you would normally start to try to change something. They wrote letters to the editor, they wrote op-ed pieces, they demonstrated in the streets, they wrote to the president, they tried to call their members of Congress. They did everything feasible to try to stop the nuclear bomb testing. Ultimately, they weren't successful then, and they decided they needed to escalate in their tactics. So they decided to get a boat and sail it into the testing zone and just put their lives in the way of the nuclear bomb tests. So Albert Bigelow bought the Golden Rule and sailed it out of San Pedro near Los Angeles. And really it's a dream come true for me. It's a dream come true to be able to be a part of this movement that uh, began before I was born and now I'm able to use what skills I've, I've obtained over the course of my years to engage in uh, resistance to the abomination of nuclear war and war in general. We want to help the public understand that there are other ways to deal with potential conflicts with other countries than to declare war or even threaten war or even for our country to be constantly preparing for war. We spend over half of the, the IRS income tax dollars on war. War is so nonsensical to begin with. It's just, it doesn't solve anything. It always ends up we have to be talking in the end and why not be talking in the beginning? It's just a proliferation of the military industrial complex, which is what Eisenhower warned against. It's taking all of our money away from our schools and our health care, things of great importance. Yeah, well, I think the Pacific Ocean should be living up to its name because Pacific means peaceful. So I would like for this to be the Pacific Ocean. And what's happening is that all the nuclear powers are developing their nuclear weapons, and the U.S. has recently committed itself to a trillion dollars over the next 30 years to modernize and actually create some new nuclear weapons that are smaller, more tactical, more usable, to make the possibility of a nuclear war even more thinkable is what's happening right now. They maintain that they need nuclear weapons for their whole security strategy, but you know, what kind of strategy is that? Mutually assured destruction. And the very real threat of a nuclear war between North Korea and the U.S. with uh, 
our uh, President Donald Trump threatening to totally destroy North Korea. Of course, North Korea promising to respond in kind. So it's a very, very dangerous situation right now. Affirm, Baker, this is semaphore. This is the letter N in semaphore. This is the letter D in semaphore. So it's nuclear disarmament. And that is the, uh, the sign that evolved, the peace sign. As we sail on our voyages, we've had three years now, mostly on the West Coast. And we're always running into people who are either new people on the crew of the Golden Rule or on the sister ship, uh, Phoenix of Hiroshima. So there's a lot of history there. We run into like Quaker activists who say they went to their first demonstration when they were seven years old when their parents took them to a demonstration to free the crew of the Golden Rule. So they got to Honolulu, they resupplied, and they were headed to the Marshall Islands. Well, the Coast Guard cutter brought them back. And they ended up putting the members on trial and convicting them of a number of violations that were ultimately thrown out. So that attracted nationwide attention and uh, worldwide attention, ultimately. During their trial in Honolulu, another boat appeared at the same dock, two slips down, the Phoenix of Hiroshima, captained by Dr. Earl Reynolds, who had just spent three years studying the effects of radiation on children in Hiroshima. And they heard the story, and they attended the trial, and they were so moved by the bravery of these men that were going to put their lives in danger to stop this terrible arms race, they decided that they would take the baton and they would go to the Marshall Islands and put their own lives in the way. And when they got into the atomic testing zone, the Coast Guard caught up with them and arrested them and sent them back to Honolulu for trial. What that protest uh, started was a worldwide uh, protest against nuclear atmospheric testing resulted ultimately in the signing of the Partial Test Ban Treaty of 1963. It also spawned the uh, founding of Greenpeace and other activist organizations. Bigelow sold the boat, the Golden Rule. After the Golden Rule was sold in Honolulu, nobody heard from it for decades. And then in 2010, she was a derelict boat floating around in Humboldt Bay, and she sank in a gale. We're about to be in the air and sea show that the Navy puts on. When you bring the Navy warships and the warplanes into a city, what you're doing is normalizing war. It's a way to desensitize, especially our young people, but also the voters, to think that militarization of our country is a normal and okay and good and maybe even glorious thing. It blows my mind. I mean, the people aren't thinking about what this is doing to their kids. We're surrounded by machines of death and destruction. And everybody's running around like this is so cool and amazing. The government of my country is the greatest perpetrator of violence on the globe, to quote Martin Luther King. And so the air show is sort of a celebration of all that global murder and imperialism. We have to use the golden rule while we're here to show our resistance to that militarism. You know, I only wish I could do more. Now, I wish I had another lifetime that I could spend, but that's not the case, so I'm going to do everything I can to resist this anti-human, environmentally destructive, and morally defective military-industrial complex as it expresses itself here in San Diego in the air and sea show. The boat disappeared, but we found it in 2009 in Humboldt Bay. Leroy Zerlang had his crew pull her up into his boat yard. He was going to burn her. So she faced a watery grave, then she faced a fiery grave, and then Humboldt Bay Veterans for Peace and Quakers showed up and they said, Leroy, we think we want to restore this boat. Could you give us a year in your boat yard 
And, and we want to rebuild this boat. We went and visited the Golden Rule in 2011. And it was a wreck. We visited her again in 2013. And she was starting to take shape and look a little bit like a boat. They relaunched it June 15th, 2015. Then we took off July 20th. We stopped in 10 different ports of call. Our second seasonal voyage, 2016, we went all over the waters of Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, where we were able to give 23 educational presentations. And this gives us a talking point, a point of attraction to communities that we go into to draw people in so that we can get the message that there is uh, no room, no place in the world for nuclear weapons. We're going to go dish out some peace today on the ocean. Run her up, run her up, run her up, run her up. There you go. Run her up. Pull down all the body weight. Are you interested in reading about the Golden Rule? They grab us when we're young, man, because they can manipulate us. The brain's not fully developed until you're 25 years old. That's why they want you when you're about 17, 16, you know. Come here, sign, on the, sign down on the dotted line, man. We're gonna make a killer out of you. I joined the U.S. Marines uh, at a high school. I served about eight years. I served in Iraq for seven months as well, and that was eye-opening. Overall, like, there are good experiences. I met a lot of good people and a lot of good friends that I still have. Um, yeah. But then there's other experiences. Uh, and after a while, I just decided to, to you know, uh, get out and end my tour in the military. I was only in the military for four years, the early 50s in Korea. It took me a lifetime to realize what has happened to me because of that. And uh, I'm a very talkative guy, and I did not talk about Korea for more than 50 years. Yeah, I guess I'm not ready to like talk about that part. <laughs> yeah. When I flew back from Da Nang to Japan on a C-141 Air Force plane, I was flying with 200 caskets that were American military people flying home, and there were about three or four of us. And uh, we sat there for eight hours with all these uh, caskets that were there. And the thing that went through my mind was the tragedy that these families would have to face. Uh, their life would be alterably changed. And uh, right then and there, I thought, I can't be a part of any of this anymore, and that I have to do something to change it. I trained as a Special Forces or Green Beret medic, and uh, kept me in the States uh, long enough to have the opportunity to talk to a lot of veterans who were returning from Vietnam. These veterans told me stories about atrocities that U.S. troops were committing against Vietnamese civilians in Vietnam. So that kind of sealed the deal for me. I said, there's no way I can be part of that war. I was in on the uh, illegal Cambodian invasion under President Nixon. I am a combat vet, and I was a door gunner on the way out. And uh, 10 months into it, uh, I uh, had a moral uh, decision of uh, not carrying a weapon and not participating anymore. And they uh, stripped me of my rank uh, and my medals. I was probably emotionally breaking down from a lot of the combat that I had been in.
two air crews came in. They always fly together. And they came back and they were patting everybody on the back and shaking our hands. And I mean, these guys were really hyped up. And it finally came out. What happened was is one of them, they're coming back from a bombing mission and they had a 500 pound bomb left. And they decided to uh, drop it on a guy on a bicycle. And the wingman who was flying behind him said it hit the guy right in the back. He said, that was the best thing. That's when I got an inkling. But this really wasn't about protecting anybody. It's a shame. Uh, we got a boat coming up on your starboard. Being ashamed of myself. So, uh, And being ashamed of my country, because we're not supposed to be like this, taking each other's lives over resources and, and, uh, and objects. I think uh, we bring a unique perspective. And look, at the American people usually honor the military. Whereas other people, they may say, you know, uh, that's just some sort of peace, Nick, I don't need to listen. But when veterans who have, uh, that are members from World War II to Korea to Vietnam to the current conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, people will at least listen to you. They may not end up agreeing with you, but they'll at least give you the opportunity to express their view. And I think that's what makes the position unique. I'll see you there. I hope you will. Come into the meeting. We'll all be happy to see you. <laughs> OK. It feels nice to be on here. It just feels more, more in line with you know, me and my spirit. He's 41, I'm, I'm 70, and here we are, a generation of, of veterans out here on the water, floating for sanity in an insane world. <laughs> We've been specifically sailing in support of the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which just passed uh, last month or so, 122 to 1 in the United Nations General Assembly. So it's a very exciting development. If you love this planet, you will sign this treaty. Nuclear weapon has always been immoral. Now they are also illegal. I'm really excited about the Nobel Peace Prize being given to the International Coalition to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. So what can you do? to help stop the possibility of nuclear war. What we're doing about it is through education. You can join our team. You could be an author, a speaker. You can donate. You can get involved with helping organize events and helping other people. Well, the original mission of the Golden Rule was to take bold action to stop nuclear bomb testing, to stop nuclear war. And so we've decided to head for the Pacific, where the action is at this time. We're planning to go to Hawaii, where the crew originally went to Honolulu, and they're also facing real uh, threat and fears of uh, nuclear war in Hawaii right now, where they've just resumed a whole statewide alarm system uh, for the event of incoming nuclear weapons. Then we're going to go on to the Marshall Islands, where the original crew was headed. The Marshall Islands continues to suffer from the results of all the nuclear bombing that was done. There's a very high cancer rate there. From there, we would head to Guam, to Okinawa, and it's from there that bombers are flying over the Korean Peninsula. Then we want to go to Japan no later than 2020, when they're going to be commemorating the 75th anniversary of the horrific U.S. nuclear bombings of the civilian populations in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If possible, we may even sail the Golden Rule right to the Korean Peninsula with our message of peace. It's time to sail this little boat across the Pacific once again to put ourselves in the way of nuclear war. The question becomes, who is going to lead the effort to eliminate nuclear weapons? Who's going to step up? Who's going to speak out? You know, hope is something, in my opinion, that comes about with the effort put forth by human beings. 
but hope in and of itself is uh, empty. When people are putting forth great effort, then there's hope. We did take the Golden Rule to Hawaii in 2019 and we sailed around the Hawaiian Islands giving presentations for 22 months and then we were getting ready to go to the Marshall Islands and it was March of 2020. Exactly. So the countries closed down and we couldn't give in-person presentations and we decided ultimately to bring the Golden Rule back to the United States. Once we got back to California, we decided to implement the vision of the people that restored the Golden Rule, which was to sail all of the navigable waters of the United States. So we'd already done all the way from you know, Vancouver and Victoria, BC, down to Ensenada, Mexico, all around the Hawaiian Islands. So we decided to do what's called the Great Loop. Normally you start anywhere along this Great Loop, bounded by the Mississippi River, around the coast of Florida, up the East Coast, and several ways and around the Great Lakes and then back down where you can cross your wake. And so it's a very popular thing for boaters to do. Uh, one or two hundred do it every year. But you don't normally start in Mississippi. And when you get down to the tip of Florida, you don't normally go to Cuba. And you don't normally go up to Portland, Maine, and beyond so you can protest at Bath Iron Works. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a very unusual great loop. But it will take us um, 12 to 15 months, depending on what we decide to do when we get back to Chicago. And so we do, when, whenever we come into port, we do what we do now. We talk about, like, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the Back from the Brink measures. Um, sometimes people like to talk about nuclear energy or depleted uranium or uranium mining and all the damage that's, that, that's been done. Um, where the victims are still suffering, uh, for example, on the Navajo and Dakota Sioux reservations, those native peoples are suffering from additional cancers because of uranium mining, and when you take oil out of the ground there, it's often got radioactive elements in it as well. So um, there's a lot of current victims of just any part of the uranium pathway. So we need to leave it in the ground. We need to get rid of everything having to do with uranium and its daughter products and its plutonium cousin that's the most toxic substance that doesn't even naturally occur on this planet. And so um, I'm going to leave it to other people to talk about the treaty, how it came about, um, the nuclear ban treaty, which is the treaty that um, kind of completes the whole let's get rid of the weapons of mass destruction internationally. So chemical and biological weapons, cluster bombs, and landmines are all internationally illegal. That doesn't mean the United States has signed on to them. But now um, nuclear weapons are also illegal, as Setsuko Thurlow said in the movie. So we are proud members of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, both as Veterans for Peace and as the Golden Rule Project. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. All right. Hello. Uh, my name is Madison Rose, and I am on staff at the Union of Concerned Scientists. I'm also on the steering committee of Back from the Brink, bringing communities together to abolish nuclear weapons, which I will talk a lot more about. Um, and since we are here at Friends Meeting of Washington, I wanted to also share my Quaker credentials. <laughs> uh, I am an attender at Adelphi Friends Meeting in Maryland. Um, I also did Quaker voluntary service in Portland, Oregon, uh, with Physicians for Social Responsibility, which is sort of what brought me to nuclear weapons. Um, and I also attended Haverford College. So those are my, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I don't always get that reception in all places. So <laughs> not like bad, but not just that exciting. Uh, all right, so 
I'm gonna take us a little bit big picture and then also bring us back to the local level to talk a little bit more in detail about the threats we're facing as nu for nuclear weapons, um, why they are so bad, which I think we've already have a pretty good sense, um, as well as what we can do about it, which is what I'm really gonna hope to focus on. So I might go quickly through the kind of bad, scary stuff um, to really focus on what we can do about it. So current nuclear weapons threats. So right now we have nine nuclear powers in the world um, and we, there's about 15,000 nuclear weapons in the global arsenal. So that's actually less than at the height of the Cold War when there were 60,000. Um, but if, if you don't already think this, hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll agree that the answer should be zero. <laughs> it really needs to be zero. Um, so we're, we're definitely, there's too many. <laughs> there's always been too many. Um, in addition, I want to highlight these four problematic policies that the United States has right now um, that are unfortunately making nuclear war increasingly more likely, and again, more likely than we would like to have. <laughs> um, so first use. The United States currently reserves the right to start a nuclear war, to be the first to launch a nuclear weapon. We also have our weapons, many of them are on hair trigger alert, which basically means they can be launched very quickly, reach their targets in half an hour or less, um, also very bad. Uh, sole authority, the United States president has the sole authority to launch nuclear weapons and nobody can do anything about it. <laughs> Once that launch order is, is sent off, they will be launched. And finally, um, as was mentioned in the video, the United States is currently under, we're underway on a plan to replace the entire United States nuclear weapons arsenal with enhanced weapons. Um, they said $1 trillion. I've heard also $1.7 trillion, $2 trillion. I think it depends a little on how you do the numbers, but it's a lot. <laughs> and again, uh, definitely the opposite direction. We do not need new weapons. We do not need enhanced weapons. We need less weapons and zero weapons. Um, and I also uh, want to make sure to highlight, as we're probably all aware, the current geopolitical situation we're in between the, the war in Ukraine, rising tensions with China, has unfortunately really made nuclear war more likely again, um, and in some ways raised the consciousness. I will say my, my day job, I talk to people about nuclear weapons, I do outreach, um, and it's been a little bit more top of mind for folks um, in the last year, um, but for bad reasons, right? So um, those are, we're kind of, pushing back against headwinds, or however you would use that phrase. Unfortunately, a lot of things are going in the wrong direction um, in the way that nuclear weapons are discussed, particularly in the United States. And I should also add, most of my work is, is US focused. Um, we're focused on US policies, um, but obviously there are eight other countries that possess nuclear weapons. Again, I wanna just ground us a little bit on what makes nuclear weapons so devastating. This is heavy stuff, so I'm not gonna, not gonna try to dwell on it too much. Happy to answer more questions, but I wanna make sure we're aware of what, what it is that makes these weapons so bad. Um, and also, I wanna give a, a very small science lesson. I am not a scientist, but I work with many of them. Um, so just to get us on the same page. Um, so the center of every atom has a nucleus, and breaking that nucleus apart or combining it together can release large amount of energy. And that's essentially what a nuclear weapon is. It's a little more complicated, but it's essentially a lot of energy um, due to that releasing or coming together and the explosion that happens. So the combination of a flash of... <laughs> it's kind of fitting. It's sort of fitting. It's a little dramatic. Um, so... <laughs> exactly. Um, I feel like it's adding to the dramatic effect of this. Because this is the scary bit, right? Like, what would actually happen if a nuclear weapon were to be detonated? It kind of feels unfathomable, although it's not for many people. Um, but there would be a blinding flash, a fireball hotter than the sun, evaporating anything there, a blast, a shock wave, depending on um, the, the situation where it is located, a firestorm could happen. So. Suffice to say, it's devastating, immediate loss of life, <coughs> burns, injuries, very, very bad. Um, and additionally, there is radiation. So as has already been mentioned, um, radiation 
can um, cause immediate harm, radiation sickness, as well as cancers and other illnesses in the, the decades and years to come. Um, and that's actually more prevalent among women and girls. We're doing some research at UCS um, to uncover why that is, um, or to extrapolate on, on why that is. Um, and also people who are pregnant who are exposed can often also have higher rates of miscarriage and infant mortality. And unfortunately, there's not really a way to prepare or respond to a nuclear weapon. Um, all of the infrastructure we have as a society to respond to disasters would not really be very useful in the immediate uh, short term of a nuclear weapon use. I also want to connect to climate, since I'm sure many of us here in this room are also concerned about uh, the climate crisis. And there's a few different ways that the climate crisis and nuclear weapons are connected. Um, so the first being that climate catastrophe, the disasters that are be taking place, um, often can make conflict more likely. And any conflict is bad, and any conflict that has the potential to escalate to a nuclear, nuclear war is very bad. Um, and also, as we have seen with the war in Ukraine, conventional conflict can also damage food supply, um, food pathways, um, and the climate more generally. And um, if uh, the nuclear fallout from a, a bomb that was used can get into the atmosphere and block out the sun, and we all know the sun is very important for food production. So lots of connections, and, and I'll share more um, towards the end, a lot of organizations that are sort of thinking about climate change and nuclear weapons interconnected as two of the many existential threats that humans are facing. Um, and lastly, I really wanted to highlight, and, and we've sort of already done, so I won't go too far into it, but uh, nuclear frontline and downwinder communities are the communities that are harmed already. So we define nuclear frontline communities as communities who are harmed by the extraction production, testing, cleanup, and storage of nuclear weapons and nuclear materials. Uh, people in those communities are often indigenous, people of color, poor, and or rural, and they're continuing to grapple with both the historic and ongoing exposure to radiation and toxins. Um, so I also have an example um, of the Marshall Islands is one um, that we also do a lot of work with Marshallese communities um, at UCS. And, um, I'll read this in, in case you can't see it. So from 1946 to 1958, the United States uh, used regions of the 1,200 islands and islets that make up the Marshall Islands to conduct nuclear weapons research. This included 67 atmospheric nuclear tests about the equivalent of exploding 1.6 Hiroshima-sized bombs in the Marshall Islands every day for 12 years. Yeah, <laughs> so just try, it. I find this part hard to fathom as well. People live and were living in the Marshall Islands when this was happening. <laughs> Imagine, yeah, your, your homeland being used as a test site, as a sacrifice zone. It's horrendous and horrible. Um, and unfortunately, that's just one example. Um, as Helen mentioned, the Southwest United States, lots of indigenous land where uranium mine, mining occurs, nuclear weapons testing. Um, and also, you know, other nuclear weapons states have also chosen the already oppressed communities within their countries to push off the burden of nuclear weapons too. So I'm not going to go into any more detail, but we do a lot of work uh, to try to um, rectify the harms, achieve justice. You know, you really can't when some of these islands are not even habitable anymore. Um, but we're, we're advocating alongside these communities to do what we can to, to get justice for these communities. Okay, so that's all the bad stuff. <laughs> or that's the, all I'm gonna talk about the bad stuff. Uh, the good news. So we already talked a little bit about it, uh, but I just wanna highlight the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So this is the um, international treaty that was mentioned. Um, it did enter into force in 2021, which is very exciting. Um, and a lot of what I see my work as, um, as an organizer to do is what can we do in the United States to work towards to get the country to a point where we can actually engage with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons? Because it's a tremendous treaty. 
It also reminds us that most countries in the world have chosen not to have nuclear weapons. There's only nine that do, right? So countries throughout the world, particularly in the global south, have been leading this effort since nuclear weapons became a thing to get rid of them. Um, so I just want to highlight that, that there has been tremendous leadership from countries um, who do not possess nuclear weapons and do not want to and think we shouldn't have them. And also what I really like about this treaty is it really represents a critical shift in thinking. So it pushes us to reject the supposed strategic and security role that nuclear weapons have and instead focus on the humanitarian consequences. So everything that we've already been sharing today um, is, has not always been and is still not sort of at the forefront of policy decision makers' minds, right? They use all of these coded words and security and deterrence instead of, you know, really thinking about the fact that these weapons are meant to kill millions of civilians. <laughs> like, it's, they're horrible things. So, very exciting, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, ways that we can, in the United States here, do what we can to get our own government uh, to sign the treaty. So, I am going to talk the rest of this about Back from the Brink, bringing communities together to abolish nuclear weapons. So that is a, we are a campaign, a coalition started in 2017, and we are a, I'm gonna read our exact statement, a US-based grassroots coalition of individuals, organizations, and elected officials working together toward a world free of nuclear weapons and advocating for nuclear policies to a secure a safer, more just future. So we call on the United States um, with four main points, policy points, that are um, in reaction to the problematic policies I mentioned at the beginning. So no first use, um, get rid of sole authority, stop the modernization, get our weapons off hair trigger alert, and work, uh, get a uh, verifiable agreement among nuclear armed states to abolish our nuclear weapons. So these are the, the cornerstone policies of what we at Back from the Brink focus on. Um, and in each community where um, organizers are organizing, they kind of make it their own. So sort of like Helen was saying, some communities focus on nuclear power, some communities talk about um, they have maybe a large Marshallese population or a large uh, atomic veterans population. And each of the places where um, Back from the Brink activists come together, it looks a little bit different, but we're sort of grounded in these five points that are ultimately abolishing nuclear weapons, that is the core of what we're about, and also these short-term policies that we can work on um, on a U.S. policy level to make us all safer in the meantime. So these are the logos of who is back from the brink, just to give you a, good, a better sense. Um, so Union of Concerned Scientists is where I'm from. Uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility is also one of the co-founders, um, as well as a variety of groups, uh, many faith communities, many um, environmental justice organizations, um, some that are involved with science and medicine, a whole host of, of organizations, and these are sort of the, the most involved coalition partners um, on the steering committee. And then on this slide, I have a sort of local flavor of what organizations um, and municipalities have supported. I'll read them out loud because I know the font is small. <laughs> um, so a big part of what we do in Back from the Brink is get endorsements from organizations and municipalities, like I've mentioned. So I wanted to highlight some local groups, um, including some friends meetings. So we have Baltimore Yearly Meeting, Bethesda, Frederick, Gunpowder, and Sandy Spring Monthly Meetings. Hopefully some more soon. Um, and also some other local groups include Prevent Nuclear War Maryland, Columban Center for Advocacy and Outreach, Tax Christie, Metro DC, Baltimore, Hiroshima Nagasaki Peace Committee of the National Capital Area, and Glow House. And I'm missing a bunch. <laughs> this is just a short list of, of ones that are local. Um, but also, if you um, <laughs> if you see if you don't see a group that you think should be on there, and uh, especially if you are a person who could endorse on behalf of that organization, would love to talk to you about it. Um, and then also, I wanted to highlight some of our local municipalities who have endorsed. So we're up to 77 so far, um, and that includes Washington, D.C., Prince George's County, Montgomery County, Baltimore, and Frederick in Maryland. And 
if uh, federal legislation is more of your thing, being that we're here in DC, we also do that. Um, so we have a resolution, HRES 77, that is about the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, as well as those other policy points I mentioned. Uh, and this is on a congressional level. So these are the current co-sponsors as of the last few months when it was introduced. Um, and again, if you do not see your member here, so if you do not live in D.C. or Maryland 8, uh, or if you're visiting, um, and you would be interested in advocating, that is a huge part of what we're doing now. This is really an organizing tool to get members of Congress on the record in support of nuclear weapons policy, even just kind of bringing the issue up, particularly framed in the abolition lens, is in many cases a victory. So that's a large part of what this legislation is. And that is a photo of me two weeks ago uh, making some deliveries on the Hill. Uh, we had a sign-on letter and uh, we delivered them to members of Congress. And there will soon be a Senate resolution. Um, we're working on it. <laughs> and then... And then this is my second to last slide, which is just some very concrete ways to get involved. So hopefully uh, you all saw the sign-in sheet when you walked in. If you put your information on that, I will follow up with you via email with all of this. Um, but our, the easiest and most um, comprehensive way to get involved, we're having an open house on May 10th, and that is virtual. Um, a lot of our sort of national back from the brink things happen virtually, and then people meet locally in their communities. So that'll be on May 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern. And then these are two other ways to get involved that you can find on our website, um, which are urging your representatives to endorse the congressional HRS 77 that I mentioned, as well as endorsing Back from the Brink. And you can do that as an individual on our website, or especially if you are on behalf of an organization, faith community, small, large, national, any, any group of people you're involved with um, can also endorse Back from the Brink. And this is just my information. It's also, a lot of it is on the sign-in sheet, but there is um, both for Back from the Brink, is the preventnuclearwar.org is the website and the email address. And then um, I also have our social media for the Union of Concerned Scientists. And this is my personal work email, mrose at ucsusa.org. So would love to follow up and connect with anyone who's interested. I think we'll probably have time for questions now, but this is the, the spiel and I can leave it up there if you want to take a picture, but this is me. <laughs> I'd like to point out one thing that um, we're doing specially in Washington, D.C. Uh, Veterans for Peace created their own nuclear posture review. Now, the United States nuclear posture, written by the presidents, is very aggressive, very full-spectrum dominance. Very nuclear is the core of our security strategy in the United States. And in contrast to that, Veterans for Peace analyzed every single relationship that the United States has with other nuclear armed nations and came up with a nuclear posture that would solve some of the problems of why there are these conflicts, for example, between the United States and North Korea. Why do they have nuclear weapons? We talk about um, Russia and all of the torn up treaties, all of the opportunities lost. So it's an 11 page document. We've made a, a copy of those one for every representative and one for every senator. And we're going to run all over Congress on Wednesday, April 12th. And we're going to pass one out to every office. So if you want to um, join us, come at 9 o'clock to the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And we're going to get up our, get our boxes of paper and we're going to go around the halls of Congress and pass one out to everybody. Thank you so much both. Um, that was awesome, and I'm glad to hear that there's more like concrete ways that people can make a little bit of ruckus on the Hill. Um, I think a lot of the members need that. Um, I want to go through a couple of questions that I had, a couple of things that were kind of on my mind about both the Golden Rule, the trip that you guys have been on, as well as Madison, your work with UCS. So 
Um, Ellen, I'd love to know a little bit about some of the highlights from the trip so far. There are a couple that I was thinking about in particular, and I know you might have a few of your own, but the one that I wanted to highlight, because I feel like this never got the appropriate coverage it deserved. I feel like part of that is probably intentional. Um, but you made a stop at Kings Bay, Georgia. And Kings Bay, for those who might not be familiar, Kings Bay Naval Station houses Ohio-class nuclear submarines. These are the submarines that carry Trident nuclear missiles. That's one part of what's called the nuclear triad. So nuclear tip missiles down at the southern tip of Georgia. Um, and you all stop there. Could you speak a little bit about the history of activism in Kings Bay? So we've been to both nuclear weapons um, submarine bases. We've been to the one near Seattle, yeah. th that Trident nuclear submarine base. They've got an organization there, Ground Zero, that borders on that base. And then this year we got to go to Kings Bay and protest there. Yeah, and in both times we did water-based actions and ground-based actions. It was really special. In 2016, when we went to the Pacific Northwest, we had, that was the first water-based action they'd done since 1982 when that base opened. And we had the Golden Rule, one other sailboat, and 14 kayak activists out there, and it was very dramatic. This time we had just the golden rule, but we had several of the activists from nu Nuclear Watch South out there, which was fantastic. And we went out and we filmed the golden rule in front of the base. And then we went to the base itself on land at one of the main gates, and we had these giant banners on the street corners, which they've been doing for many, many years. We also got to meet with some of the Kings Bay Plowshares folks. Um, in fact, uh, uh, what's his name, O'Neill? Um, Patrick O'Neill, mm -hmm. right, came and had a, a, some, spent the night with us and we had some meetings with him about what's it like to spend time in jail to try to, you know, get rid of nuclear weapons. So, yeah, I'm really happy about the actions that we've done. We also show up at Fleet Week where people are trying to, the military is trying to get people used to the idea of these weapons of mass destruction in their cities, and they hand these big old, you know, weapons, howitzers or whatever, I don't know, to their children to play with. Oh man, this is so cool. Well, we try to stop that as well. So um, we, we just put up our flags of peace in contrast our sales of peace in contrast to these weapons of war wherever we go. Thank you, Madam. Um, question back there? No, I want to add just a point. Uh, thank you for mentioning the Kings Bay Plowshares. I worked on this support committee for the last five years, and um, they're all great friends of mine. And we had a marvelous five years, and today is the fifth anniversary of their uh, entry into the base to attempt a disarmament action. All right. Whoa. I didn't even realize that today was the commemoration of the anniversary of that action. Um, for further context, he's referring to um, an action of I believe it was Catholic, Catholic Workers Movement, I believe. Um, Primarily, yeah. Correct. Who? Um, who? And it was chosen in particularly in honor to uh, honor Martin Luther King, um, his assassination, his Beyond Riverside speech, his insistence on uniting criticism of war and nuclearism. And he started saying bad things about nuclear weapons in the 50s um, with um, the others of his uh, evil triplets that we must confront in order to make this, our society, a, a just one. Racism, capitalism, militarism. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, so another stop, and you mentioned this earlier too, um, it was one that hit me very personally. Um, so I used to live in Portland, Maine, actually. Um, I spent a year and a half living in Portland, Maine. Uh, Maine, of course, being on the Atlantic coast, has a really big shipyard up in the city of Bath, Bath Ironworks. Bath Ironworks is operated by, of course, General Dynamics, the huge military contractor. They've got a very huge facility over in, I guess, Arlington. Go say hi. Um, and one thing that we've tried to discern here in the meeting um, as a body is if we're trying to imagine a future with no nuclear weapons, or ideally even less would be great, um, there are a lot of people who are employed in these kind of facilities at Bath Iron Works, at General Dynamics. Good jobs. I mean, Bath Iron Works is unionized. It's union electricians. They make good money. 
Um, and I can't really fault them for participating in that because that's how you earn a living in Maine. And there's not a lot of jobs in Maine. I, I wouldn't know. Um, so I was wondering if um, either of you could speak a little bit to maybe how you feel what might happen in the future when we're trying to scale things back and to transition towards an economy that is not hell bent on killing people. Even, even the people uh, that are trying to get rid of these weapons are a little bit afraid to talk about that in the counties where they are making these weapons or doing the research and things like that. But how we deal with this is, wouldn't you rather be working on something life affirming? And wouldn't you rather that your company or the company that you have shares in or the company that you bank with was involved in life affirming activities rather than life destroying activities? So, um, and everybody agrees with that. So the key is transition. And the, the jobs that can be had, there's a lot of jobs to be had in cleanup everywhere that anything to do with uranium has happened, as well as convert these factories to wind, solar, manufacturing chips, things that we need. There's a lot of things that we need to do and there's facilities to do them, a little bit of retooling and some retraining and the will to do it. And that's what we got to work on because if we don't bring this massive willpower of the people up, then it's not going to happen as fast. Madison, I was wondering if you could comment, maybe you've seen something like this in Congress, you know, like Susan Collins in Maine, maybe she doesn't have particularly strong feelings about nuclear weapons, but you know, she has jobs to protect in the state. Absolutely. The jobs argument is something we hear a lot from members of Congress, from people in, in those districts that maybe who have those jobs. I would, yeah, I would add the, the idea of a just transition, you know, in, from the climate justice movement, I think is apt in there is a way to sort of a yes and. Yes, people can have good jobs and we can have a planet to live on. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so that's, I think that's one sort of rhetorical way we answer that. I would also say there's some um, research that has been done, not, not in organizations I'm with, but um, not, and I, I can't pull the exact name of the report, but the reports have been done of how much funding towards nuclear weapons type uh, jobs, nuclear weapons industries, that same amount of money in a variety of other things like Healthcare, education, other jobs. There's there's a lot better, cheaper ways to make those jobs, um, in ways that yeah don't don't harm the planet, are, are life affirming. So I think there's there is some research. Again, we're sort of pushing back against these headwinds, and it is a real thing that these people do have these jobs. Although I would also add, many of them are incredibly dangerous. Um, there's been some research or reports out recently of some missileers in Montana. I don't know if folks have heard about this, but um, there's, is it non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? There's a, a larger than normal number of service members who are down in the missile silos working with the missiles who have gotten these horrible cancers at very young ages um, and most likely because of their exposure to, to these materials. So I think being able to hold all of this, like these are these are jobs, people need jobs, these are dangerous jobs, dangerous industry, and there are better ways, and I mean, big picture, a lot of what I see my work of doing is how do we envision a future? Like, What does it actually look like to not have nuclear weapons? What does it actually look like to have, you know, no fossil fuels? Like, that, that's really difficult. It's a, we have to allow ourselves that space to, to truly imagine what it would look like see how we get there, and then figure out why we aren't there. And many times it's following the money, <laughs> following the who's getting the paycheck, um, or who's funding the paycheck. Not, not the workers, again, the workers are not, not the problem. It's this larger industry that's enabling and, and kind of convinced us all to have this scarcity mindset, that we have to choose one or the other, either a job or a planet, but we really can't have both. I'm glad you mentioned that point about you know the defense industry and like how a lot of this a lot of the uh, the public consciousness around how you know this issue is talked about is 
you know, it's designed to be talked about that way because there's so much money sloshing around um, from these really powerful interests. And I feel like that's just one of the many reasons that this is like a difficult issue to advocate on. Like in my personal capacity, I've done minimum wage campaigns. If anybody's worked on a minimum wage campaign, very easy sell. Very easy to convince people to vote to raise the minimum wage. People like that. It's like very tangible, you can grab onto it. Um, but I was wondering if you could speak to like what do you feel is the most difficult part of this kind of advocacy in particular? Well, the people that don't have hope. Mm. So, you know, we interact with a lot of people every day. You do too. And so when I'm out there inviting people to see the golden rule and talking about what we're all about, a lot of people, they'll just say, well, good luck with that. Mm. Because they've bought into the fear mongering. They think that there's no way to deal with China and Russia and North Korea and Iran. They feel the fear that comes at them 24 seven from the media. And they don't know, they don't even realize that we went from 80,000 nuclear weapons down to 15,000 nuclear weapons at one time. And, and so they don't even think about that. And they also don't understand the self-fulfilling prophecy. If we all believe that peace is possible and nuclear disarmament is possible, it's a lot more likely that we'll then work towards that and achieve it than if we all just give up hope and just accept our fate as someday we're all gonna be vaporized. So that's the challenge is meet people where they're at and say, peace is possible and we're working to make it happen and you can too and then it's more likely to happen. <laughs> yeah, me too, I totally agree and I would say in my my work, I often, so whenever I'm speaking with someone who, you know, was not around during the Cold War, just, I think a lot of people in my generation and younger think we kind of fix the problem. <laughs> think like, oh, that was, you know, that was back then, right? And there's, and then too, but there are just so many things wrong, right? There's so many crises people are facing. I'm a big proponent, you know, I've, I've chosen nuclear weapons to work on, that's my day job, I believe it's very important, and I never say, like, this is the worst existential crisis we're facing, because existential crises mean different things to different communities, <laughs> and there is so much to do, so much happening, so just this, this despair, and yeah, the lack of hope writ large, um, the violence, all of the bad things, but I also think having people feeling tangible agency is something I'm really focusing on now. Of how can we actually feel like there's something we can do about it? So also we can't just, uh, another hear, thing I hear is, oh, well that's like a, a decision maker in Washington thing. Like oh, our members of Congress, our president, they figure it out. Clearly, they're not doing a great job. <laughs> you know, we are closer to a nuclear war than we probably have been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Things are not great. So we as constituents, we as people, we as, human beings should have a say and should have be in touch with our agency um, and also see the interconnectedness. You know, I talked about it a little bit, but these, it's not an accident <laughs> that these things are connected, you know, climate change, nuclear weapons, violence, war, racism, like these things are so inherently tied together and sometimes that makes it overwhelming, but I also, for me, I think there's a power in that of finding common cause. A lot of what we do and back from the break is partnering with organizations who maybe nuclear weapons is not at the top of mind. Maybe they're thinking, you know, I was just on a webinar today about um, the militarization of the border and um, immigration policy and, and the violence and harm. And there's connections, right? Like militarization, policing, like who counts as a human, like all, the, it's all connected. So I think trying to find the power in that and not be sort of frozen by that is something that I'm personally, professionally, and as a movement, I think we're all grappling with. Yeah, I think it's a good point to mention that it's very like far out of mind for a lot of people. It's very distant. Up? Sure, um, it's very distant, it's very abstract. It's something we kind of feel like we dealt with in the Cold War and that's all gone and dealt with now. But of course, there's a lot of people who are around now who are personally living with the impacts of nuclear weapons. And we addressed previously, you know, plenty of people that are um, in the silos, the missileers in Montana, if you're hanging out 24 hours a day in a nuclear silo, then yes, your risk of cancers is increased. Um, but there's also, of course, the communities that were, you know, downwind from the testing back in the 50s. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the role, like, the Marshallese community in particular has played in your activism. 
Well, I'd like to talk about racism for just a minute. Who was bombed in Japan? Brown people. Yeah. Who bore the brunt of the nuclear testing in Nevada? Indigenous people. Who bore the brunt of the, of the uranium mining problems? Indigenous people. Right? So I'm seeing that nuclear weapons are a racist issue as well. But as far as the Marshallese, yes. Um, you know, they come here because they can't eat their, their food. They can't grow food that's not contaminated. And they can't eat their fish because it's contaminated. The United States brings rice and spam for them to eat. That's become their favorite food. So therefore, there's diabetes, hypertension, obesity, the whole banana there. So when we were in uh, Dubuque, Iowa, we got to be with a group of 800 or 1,000 Marshallese people that have come there. There's several big communities of Marshallese people, and we interacted with them in Hawaii, and now we've interacted with them in, in Iowa. And, you know, they, they didn't even know the story about the Phoenix and the Golden Rule making it into the Marshall Islands. And when they found out about that and that they got to actually see the boat that was headed their way, they celebrated. They were playing their ukuleles and they had their traditional costumes on and singing and dancing. It was an amazing welcome that we received in Dubuque, Iowa. So I am really happy that we went there. Um, Madison, do you care to chime in further? Yeah, um, so one of my colleagues, her name is Lily Adams, she works very closely with Marshallese advocates um, and people both in, in the Marshall Islands, the Marshall Islands di diaspora. Um, one of the really unfortunate pieces, so in addition to the uh, nuclear weapons testing, the, the health problems, there was a pretty long time when the Marshall, Island, Marshall Islands Marshall Islander community in the United States was not eligible for federal benefits for, for Medicaid. So that's a very tangible example and it was sort of a mistake in the policy. It's complicated, you know. But it actually was reversed a few years ago. Um, so they have that specific right um, back. But that's an example of advocacy and sort of we as um, a science organization try to like bring what we can do to support, but there, I just want to clarify, there are many Marshallese groups, there are Marshallese people who are, you know, doing this advocacy. Um, there's a group called the Marshallese Education Initiative, MEI, um, Benedict Madison, there's a lot of great groups um, who, are, who are doing it, particularly now there's negotiations underway um, with the uh, COFA, so that's... Um, the Compacted Free Association. Thank you. <laughs> it totally left my brain. Um, so it's the Marshall Islands and a few other Pacific Islands. Um, and that's uh, basically it's sort of the way that the United States and these um, islands are, the relationship, like what that means. And part of the negotiations underway right now are how much the United States sh should be responsible, like take responsibility for this nuclear weapons testing, the legacy, the current effects. Um, as well as, you know, how much funding should be put to uh, cleaning up the, the nuclear materials that are there. And of course, with climate change, rising seas, there's this huge dome that they just put nuclear materials in and is now leaking. And it's, it, anyway, it gets worse and worse <laughs> the more you learn. But just to clarify that we, you know, we at UCS and many other groups are um, working in partnership, letting these communities lead, um, doing what we can to support. But there is, it's really... I find it really important to listen to the stories and, and hear, yeah, so I would just encourage you if you're interested to, to learn more from those organizations um, and yeah, so there's, there's lots happening in the Marshall Islands specifically right now. Yeah, it's great to hear. Um, I see we're running a little close on time, so I want to wrap up with one question to leave a little bit optimistically. Um, briefly, both. Next 10 years, assuming all the nuclear weapons don't get used, let's hope not. Um, <laughs> What good things do we have to look forward to? Well, we could sign up a, a treaty to stop <laughs> the possibility of nuclear war. And so all the things you were talking about with Back from the Brink, we could certainly do that. We could elevate the level of consciousness. I mean, that's what we're, we've been doing for the last, you know, eight years. That's what we're doing right now. <laughs> exactly, is talk about what the, the fact that 
they are, they are still here, they are still dangerous, we're closer than ever. Education is key because you can't have a big grassroots movement unless you educate people as to why they should care about it. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think I'm constantly motivated by younger generations of people taking action on a variety of issues. So I think what gives me hope is young people, you know, future generations. But I think even even right now, some days it does feel like we're we're hitting a wall. We're kind of pushing back. But I think having the being able to hold the past and the recognition that we did reduce nuclear war, war or nuclear, nuclear stockpiles. Um, you know, it was just the anniversary of the 1982 um, demonstration in New York City. I don't know if anyone in the room was there, but <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, I thought maybe. Uh, you know, that was like the, the largest uh, organized, largest protest of like ever at the time, right? It was yeah. a big deal. So anyway, so I think being able to hold like this legacy of people um, in the United States, in the global south, who have been fighting, who have been pushing back against these weapons. Um, so how can we build that work? How can we be aware of all the exciting things that are happening in the present with the treaty, with uh, you know local municipalities, local people working on things, and then looking forward to the future and really just that imagining. I think if, if there's anything I would encourage us to think about is really how can we viscerally imagine the world we want to look, what we want the world to look like? What would a world without nuclear weapons look like? What would it feel like? And then holding that as real in our imagination so that we can work towards it and continue building upon what's happened in the past and what's in the future to achieve that world. I, I do believe it's possible. You know, I just want to say one quick thing about that. There's a play that was, was used and could be used anytime you want. You get children to do just that. You imagine that we live in a nuclear-free world, and then the play is about how you got there. And it's, re it's a really creative exercise that might be able to engage people. And it could be used for any particular issue. I think it's a brilliant idea. And so any of you that are teachers or interact with students, you might want to think about, hmm, how could I use that to help change the world? Thank you both so much. I want to turn it over a little bit to a brief Q&A. I think we have a couple minutes um, still. I did see hand up over there previously. Yeah, just, Go for uh, it. just want to remind people that the next event is also at all polls on April 16th. Uh, please bring your friends. Um, this is so very instructive about the about the Central Park event, the St. Louis event in Central Park. Uh, we have to remember that 31 buses went from D.C. to New York for that event. Mm -hmm. So let's acknowledge D.C. for, for mm -hmm. who it is and what it is. <laughs> right. Uh, the other thing is uh, uh, most people know that I'm associated with the arts and the role of the arts in nuclear weapons abolition engaging in teaching peace culture transformation. So I would also say that um, I know that we're starting big with, with our federal legislators, but we can also look smaller. That is, um, Jackie Cabasso did great work in lifting um, the, the, the resolutions uh, for the US Conference of Mayors. I'm working on the African American Mayors Association to do much the same thing. Because mayors are the first line of uh, municipal government, and we can move them. We can move. I'm also, you know, I'm not a data wonk, but I believe in the Pareto principle that you focus on the 20 percent to move the 80 percent. Huh. If you identify the 20, you're doing that federal. They can move the 80. Develop relationships with the 20. I think that's that's significant. But please come on the 16. Invite your friends. We got lots and lots of space. We're planning, and uh, you know, there, there's there's going to be some good stuff there. As well. um, the golden rule is going to be at the at, at the Alexandria Wharf, and then at the DC Wharf from now until the 17th. They're going to have open boats, and one of the best ways of reaching people 
is to have volunteers who take the flyers, stand on the wharf, and talk to people and say, did you know there's a boat over there, and start talking to folks. And the crew can't do that. They're going to be at the boat. But I think if people want to do something while the boat is here, a really inspirational thing is the boat. And look at the, go to the Veterans for Peace Facebook page, the, the Golden Rule Project Facebook page, check out the schedule, find out what day there's an open boat, go down to the boat either in Alexandria or in DC, and spend a couple of hours leafly out there on the wharf to all the 80% uh, who are walking around in the wharf and don't have a clue. If you want to know about all of our events, just go to vfpgoldenrule.org. We have all of the Washington area events, and then pretty soon I'll take those down and put up the Annapolis, Baltimore, and Philadelphia events that are coming up. Debbie? Um, on the resolution, which sounds like a good idea, I couldn't help but notice that uh, everyone who signed on is a Democrat. Um, and I was wondering, are you making any progress with Republicans, and how do you account for the fact that you don't have any Republicans on the resolution? Great question. Um, <laughs> I will say I, I work for a 501c3, <laughs> so just to, to start with that, that um, I would say on the some of our legislation that we're working on around um, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, which I, I didn't get into, but that's um, a bill that will give compensation to people who are exposed to radiation. Um, that is one area where we've had bipartisan uh, support, in part because a lot of the areas where the testing and impacted communities are, are in uh, more red states. Um, so that's, that's an exciting uh, area. Um, beyond that, unfortunately, it is <laughs> pretty, pretty uh, polarized, um, just like the, many of our other issues. I would say sometimes there are people who are concerned with um, budgets and the amount that the government spends that off sometimes yeah. find common cause because of the tremendously large amount of money that the United States government spends on the military and nuclear weapons. Um, but I think unfortunately the fear mongering, the um, xenophobia, the war hawk, hawkishness, um, really makes it difficult for most members of Congress beyond the sort of people who make it their platform to really speak out um, in any way against most elements of the military, including nuclear weapons. Um, I wish I had a better answer. I mean, we're working on it, <laughs> you know, we, um, but I think unfortunately the reality is it's, it's pretty polarized and um, most of our support has been from progressives and, and Democrats, but yeah, it's, a, it's an important question. <laughs> of course, you go, you'll live in an important area because it's a non-voting member of the House of Representatives, Eleanor Holmes Norton, that is perpetually introducing the Nuclear Abolition and Energy and Economic Conversion Act. Right, right. So, you know, She's very special. <laughs> yeah. um, further questions in the back? Anybody else? Awesome. I think Helena has the hat to pass around to uh, Friends Meeting of Washington has contributed financially to support the work of Veterans for Peace, which helped raise the Golden Rule. The hat going around, however, is going to be to the Wait, where's the hat? The hat. <laughs> <laughs> the hat and the Gandhi. The hat is going <laughs> Okay, I, I guess we left the hat next door. The point is, uh, we are collecting donations to help support the work of Back from the Brink, Madison's organization. Um, there's a QR code in there as well. Please donate as you feel led. Um, the last thing I will plug, too, is those events that we do have coming up with the Golden Rule, either um, larger Capital F Friends meetings or other ones. There is the event at FCNL next Wednesday morning to go to the Hill to deliver letters to members of Congress and to the Senate. Uh, there is that event next Sunday over at All Souls Unitarian Church. That is going to be from 1.30 to 4.30. 16th, uh, Easter Sunday. Thank 16th. you, thank you, the 16th, the 16th. Um, at, uh, While I pass this around, you can either put money in or you can take out this little thing which gives you a QR code, which right. lets you pay online. Donate. Thanks. Simple, <laughs> back from the brink. Awesome.
Um, any further things you two wanted to plug beyond those events, um, beyond your um, your sign up thing you had to go on there, Madison? Yeah, I would just remind folks if you didn't already um, put your email address and other information um, on that sign up form, I will be in touch to kind of give you via email everything that we shared. But we all we gave just a either small slices of ways to get involved, but I would also just add if, if any of you are interested and want to chat more, if there's questions we didn't get to, I'm always happy to chat, especially with Quakers, but really with anyone, um, about, about this issue, why it's important. And there really truly is a way for all of us to get involved, even if we're very busy people with, you know, dedicated to a lot of other causes. Um, we, can all, we all have a role to play, and there's really something for everyone. So I would encourage you all to do some discernment, maybe, or, or to think more about ways that um, you can help be a part of this movement. There's also a sign-up sheet for the Golden Rule Project if you would like to receive e-news or a physical newsletter or volunteer in some way. Awesome. Madison Rose and Helena Jocker, thank you so much, y'all. I really appreciate it. their work. We have people who have done anti-nuclear work here for many, many, many decades from many great groups. The Catholic Worker of Pax Christi Universe and Plowshares folks represented by Paul here. We've got the Unitarian Universalists who have been amazing for decades and decades on this issue. The yeah, Quakers yeah, yeah. and this meeting here gave a thousand bucks, which is a lot of money back in 1958, to help pay for that vote, uh, the Golden Rule. Uh, we've got, you know, people from a variety of other organizations here and movements that have really made a, a big, a big uh, contribution. And it, it's, uh, it feels great to be here with so many groups and so many people. We need to revitalize our anti-nuclear movement, obviously, but we've got a core uh, of folks and groups that have really done remarkable work. And so thank you, everybody.